national head of the British Armed Forces and the most senior uniformed military advisor to the government. In an exclusive interview, he spoke to me about how the military will meet the challenges of the future. I started by asking him about the new Ranger Regiment and how it would be different from the Royal Marines and the Paras. When I was head of the army, we created things called specialised infantry battalions. And the idea behind them is that they would uh, do training, advice and assistance to local forces um, in Africa or Asia or wherever else it might be. Um, and they have, would become um, expert in the sort of relevant culture and locality where they were performing their tasks. What we've now decided is that that's a, an, an important function that will continue to be performed. But on top of that, what we need are um, similar organisations, but which will be special forces, um, which will be able to go beyond train advice and assistance to actually accompany these local forces on operations. And that means they will be uh, very well equipped, uh, they will be very well trained, and of course will have been selected for their roles. I think the roles ultimately will be open to uh, anybody uh, in the armed forces and certainly in the army. Um, and their function will be very similar to uh, US Green Berries, um, who have over years uh, provided that sort of uh, capability. Now, when you're talking about um, the Marines and the Parachute Regiment, um, they are not special forces. They're very high-end conventional forces. And, of course, what they will do is to continue to provide their uh, traditional role, uh, either in terms of literal manoeuvre, as we call it, with Royal Marines, and the raiding associated with it, which is where the future commando force is going, um, or in the case of um, the Parachute Regiment as part of 16 Air Assault Brigade, you know, they are our uh, capability to be able to do air manoeuvre and for that matter um, air assault uh, if, if necessary. So they are high-end conventional forces, they're not technically special forces, which is what these rangers will be once we've raised them. Troops currently in the army will be wondering where the reduction in numbers will come from. Do you know yet? Um, no, it's being planned at the moment uh, by the army. Um, it's going to require a bit of restructuring, obviously. Um, it's restructuring that um, is going to make them uh, better able to deal with the challenges of this era of constant competition that we're in. Um, and I think that uh, that will take a while to work through. But I think what's encouraging about it is that they will be much better structured to be able to be um, used regularly. And I think what the Integrated Reviewers heralded and the Defence Com Command paper that has followed is the opportunity for the army to be more in use. So I think it'll be a very attractive army to belong to. And how are you going to make the reserve force more productive? What investment is going to be made in the reserves? Well, of course, um, there's been an independent review of the reserves. You'll remember if you hark back to 2011 and 12, there was something called Future Reserves 2020. It'll very much have roles that will be associated with resilience. And we've learnt the importance of that during uh, the COVID crisis, of course. Um, but it'll also pick up roles that it's not done in the past because we genuinely believe that some of the resilience we need for war fighting in the future can be found in the reserve. And there are many tasks that the reserve can perform to do that. Um, so it will be, um, it'll be an exciting thing to join. It'll be very much um, designed into um, our integrated force structure. You know, it won't be the sort of reserves um, dappled on top. Uh, it'll actually be about them being properly integrated uh, as part of our structure. The former commander of Joint Forces Command General, Sir Richard Barron, has told us last week he supported the direction of travel, but said big cuts should be delayed until we were clear about the new capability we're going to introduce, that mixture of manned, unmanned and autonomous capability, which he said is barely even in development yet. What's your response to that? There are finite resources. Um, and where I think we're very fortunate on this particular occasion is for the first time in my career, we have a clear understanding of the ends, as in what the Prime Minister announced two weeks ago with the integrated review. We have a pretty clear understanding of the ways, uh, which are integrated operating concept, which describes how modern deterrence will be affected in this era of constant competition. And importantly, we have the means uh, with a generous settlement in the spending review last November. Now, if you, those three things are you know, more or less in balance, which is a very unusual position for us to be in. Because normally what happens is that, you know, within weeks of a defence review being announced, the Public Accounts Committee will be arguing that there's a black hole that needs to be filled and so on and so forth. And on this particular occasion, 
given the decisions that have been taken, which have been made in confident knowledge that we have a multi-year settlement, and indeed for defence it means 188 billion over four years, which is an increase in 24 billion over four years, that means that we have the confidence to be able to take some tough decisions now to make sure that there are no black holes, that the programme is in balance, and that that means we can take decisions to work out what we are going to bring into service in due course to modernise ourselves. Now, some of that is going to be cutting edge stuff. Some of it may well require experimentation and research and development to deliver it. But the key thing is that we can plan with confidence that we've got balanced books. And that's a position I can't recall before. Now, in terms of some of the capabilities, I think in the air domain, it's very easy to chart that future. Uh, I think it's more challenging in the land domain, uh, where I think um, the extent to which robotics and automation are making a big difference is probably slightly further away. But broadly speaking, I think we can be confident that these sorts of technologies are increasingly available. And given the exponential um, change that we're under at the moment, I think it's a perfectly reasonable horse to back, recognising that an army of 72,500 could probably deal with the sorts of threats that we're talking about envisaging in the next 10 years, particularly in partnership with our allies and with a much more productive reserve. Are we therefore not envisaging a campaign the likes we saw in Afghanistan with the troop numbers we saw there and in Iraq? People have learnt a lot of lessons from our entanglements in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think the big question that we need to ask ourselves is what are the lessons from that and will we want to do it like that again? Um, and I think that, you know, in looking forwards, what we're trying to achieve through specialised infantry battalions, through ranger battalions, through a much improved defence attaché network, is if we can get upstream and generally upstream and generally understand the context before we get involved in it, there's a reasonable chance perhaps that we can make a difference in front of it rather than behind it. And I think, you know, we as military professionals need to look forwards, not backwards. The plain fact is that if we wanted to do an enduring operation um, with a combination of a reserve being mobilised and all the other things associated with it, we could probably do it. But I think there's a big question mark about whether we'd want to do it like that in the future. Of course, space is a domain recognised for its growing importance and Space Command launches this week. How critical is space power to the UK's national security? Space is very much... Um, one of the modern operational domains that's going to have a huge bearing on our ability to be able to operate in the sort of digital and technical environment that we've been touching on in this conversation. Um, and space at the moment provides us with our means of global positioning. It provides us with a huge amount of our communications capability. Uh, and in future, I think it will provide a huge amount of our intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance capability. And indeed, some of that will happen in space, perhaps rather than in the air domain. So the answer is it's, it's really important. What also is important, though, I think, is that we recognise that it's a domain that is not uh, subject yet to sort of rules and regulations like the other domains are. And therefore, we need to be really careful about some of the slightly reckless and irresponsible behaviour that's been going on in space over the last several years. Um, and what is not needed, frankly, is for us to end up with some of these capabilities being threatened in space. So it's timely that we think about it as an operational domain. It's timely that we invest in making sure that we can operate in space. Uh, but it is also timely to reflect on the extent to which the UK actually, as the Prime Minister announced, is really quite good in space in terms of our science and technology sector. And actually, there's much to be said for uh, investing in something that is good for British industry and actually will be good for the prosperity of our country. And finally, uh, to sum up, how big a moment is this for the future shape and purpose of the armed forces? I mean, I think, and I've often said it, that we are now moving from an industrial age of platforms to an information age of systems. Now, the answer is that this isn't, I don't think, a revolution. It's going to be a very rapid evolution. And therefore, to use the term, we'll want to hang on um, to some of our uh, traditional capabilities um, as we advance towards the digital age, uh, because it won't happen overnight. But the trick is to do it in a fashion where you try and keep one foot on the ground as you take your steps forward. So it's about getting the balance right. So I don't think it's a moment of revolution, but I do think it's a moment when we're looking to the future and recognising that we are in an ever-evolving moment of change, which if we don't embrace that change, uh, there is a real risk that we'll get left behind. 
So I think it is a recognition that we're in a different place. Uh, but we're particularly in a different place when it comes to the requirement for a strategic culture that can deal with an era of constant competition. Now, the last 20 years have been relatively straightforward in that we've been focused on counterterrorism and everything associated with that. The 10 years before that, it was a unipolar world where peacekeeping was relevant, to, of course. And before that, of course, it was the Cold War. You know, we haven't been involved in great power competition for some time. Um, and I think that that requires us to reflect pretty deeply on this being a, a, a moment of transition 